In this video, we're going to talk about the main ideas of limits. We're going to talk about what limits describe, why we need limits, some key ideas for limits, and the different possible answers to a limit question. So in order to provide some examples to kind of refer to and spur some conversation about why limits are important, I put these six graphs on here. So we're going to kind of look at those. Um, when you glance at those, you might notice that they have some similarities and some differences. And while there are many, many things you could probably list that are similarities and differences between these graphs, I'm just going to list a few really important ones. So one is that these graphs are all functions they would all pass vertical line test and they would satisfy the definition of what it means to be a function. Uh, they all have points at 0, 0 and another point at 1, 1. They all have a domain that includes everything between x equals 0 and x equals 1. Um, some of them have a domain that extends a little bit left of x equals 0 and some of them do not appear to based on the graph. Uh, they all have a domain that extends to the right of x equals 1. Uh, some of them the domain appears to perhaps stop, C in particular. The domain appears to perhaps stop when we're uh, very far away from x equals 1. For the other graphs it appears that the domain maybe goes all the way to infinity. One important difference in the graphs of these functions is they all behave kind of differently around x equals 1. All right, so this really provides why we would need to look at limits um, because we have these kinds of different behaviors really around x equals 1. And that is a key word that we're going to emphasize over and over again that limits are really about what's going on around a point. Um, sometimes when students look at these graphs of these functions they think that some of these functions are more uh, typical kinds of functions and other ones maybe not. Uh, in algebra and maybe pre-calculus you might be used to looking at graphs like a and b here. A appears to be the graph of a line, so maybe you could even write the equation of that line. B looks like a graph of a polynomial function, again one you kind of study in algebra. Uh, some of these other graphs look a little strange and so sometimes students think maybe those are not functions that you would come across very often. C, D, and E, however, come up in many applications that have to do with functions switching between an off and an on state. So you would have something that is off until a particular time and then turns on, or in the case of C, something that starts out off and ramps up to a particular value and then switches back down and then comes up again like something that cycles over and over again. Graph F uh, looks a little bit like something that you might see on a stock market graph or something like that. So graphs like that come up a lot when you have data that is kind of all over the place and a little more jagged like that. So these are certainly functions that come up in applications you know beyond math. So it is important that we understand how to describe these other kinds of functions as well. All right so one of the important things I talked about is that all of these functions have a point at 1, 1, but many of them behave differently around 1, 1. And so that's the key thing that limits help us describe, is limits are important to help us describe things that behave differently around the, a point. That notion of being around a point should seem a little bit vague and so of course we will formalize that a little bit later and describe exactly what it means to be around a point. All right, but two key ideas about limits. Limits are not, 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 not about what's happening with the function at a point. And I'm going to use here for a point just x equals a to be kind of a generic x coordinate. Um, the second important thing is to understand that limits do 
what happens around x equals a. All right, and so we have some specific symbols that we already have from algebra to describe what happens at a point, and we're going to have some different notation to help us describe what happens around a point. So for all of these functions, we have a point at 1, 1, so we can use function notation to describe what happens at x equals 1. So this notation means that when x equals 1, when x equals 1, the output or y is also 1. So function notation that you have from algebra helps you describe what happens at a point and what we're going to be looking at here is limits to help us describe what happens around a point. So when we write limits we write something that looks like this when you see it typed in your book it'll just say LIM. Uh, I tend to write my L's cursive. Uh, x approaches a, or in this case we might be interested in when x approaches 1. So we'd say the limit as x approaches a of f of x. And so then we'll talk next about what are the different kinds of answers you might have for a limit as x approaches a of f of x. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about in this part of the video is the different possible answers that you might have to a limit question. And essentially there are four different possible answers you might ever have. Some of these are introduced in the beginning of our chapter and some are not introduced until later. But I find that if I just help students understand what are the four possible answers right from the beginning, then it's not so confusing when we uh, talk about some different things later. All right, so the first possible answer to a limit question is we would write the limit as x approaches a of f of x is equal to l, where l is some number. We use l for limit. Okay, so the kind of informal idea about what it means when we write something like that is that when x is arbitrarily close to a, as close as we want to x equals a, but remember not at x equals a, the function outputs or the y values get arbitrarily close to this number l. All right, so that's one possible answer to a limit question. Another possible answer to a limit question, and we won't actually see these until later in the chapter, is the limit as x approaches a of f of x equals infinity. All right, so the informal idea of what it means to write something like that is that when x is arbitrarily close to a, I'm just going to write close here, the outputs of the function grow without bound. So they just get larger and larger and larger with no limit to how large they get. So y gets larger and larger without bound. We can have another couple of possible answers to a limit question. Another possible answer to a limit question would be that instead of the outputs getting larger and larger and larger in the positive direction without bound, we might have a limit as x approaches a of f of x that is negative infinity. This means pretty similar to what we had right above where the limit is positive infinity, but we would say that the y values get larger in size but negative. So when x is close to a but not at a, y is larger in size but negative in direction. We have to be a little bit careful about saying a large negative number because of how inequalities work with negative numbers. All right, so those are basically describing several different things about what might be happening with y values when x is really close to a. And so those are some possible answers. You get a number, of course it could be lots of different numbers, but a number, infinity, 
or negative infinity. And then there's basically one more answer that you sometimes get to a limit question, um, which is worth talking about right now. So the last possible answer that you're going to get for a limit question is to say that the limit does not exist. In essence, this means none of the above. So the limit is not a number, L. The limit is not infinity. The limit is not negative infinity. So again, this is really saying that when x is close to a, y does not approach a number, L. or grow without bound, larger and larger without bound, or negative infinity, larger and larger in size but in the negative direction. So in some ways this is a sort of none of the above answer to a limit question. But these are the only four answers you should ever have for a limit question. Uh, often when we write something like does not exist we might abbreviate that D-N-E. Our book will usually write that out, but on my videos and scratch work I'll often write D-N-E. Sometimes I have students think that I'm writing the number one and spelling it out, but that's not what this means. It means does not exist, and that's a pretty common uh, abbreviation that you'll see.